you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the seven fallen houses in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the house of fire and stone, the Malefactors. Little lamb, I feel that if you took a different walk of life, you would have made a decent host to a demon. Now, you could take that as a compliment if you wish, but I really meant it as you are a needy, insecure soul with a clear hunger for something more that would make all your dreams come true. As a vampire, you are naturally a cunning individual, though that part needs a lot more work. See? I can compliment and give criticism. And what sort of forum would have taken an interest in you? Hmm... I'm glad you asked. I'm talking about the Fundamentals, the House of Anunnaki, who, like all of us fallen, were fundamental (laughs) in the creation of everything. You wouldn't have your liver without them, for one thing. A very specific example I know, but allow me to explain. The Malefactors, the former shapers and users of Earth and all that fell within, they are artisans who use these fabricating powers to turn mundane into gifts of splendor that ultimately corrupt the wielder, possessor, whatever. In other words, these are the classic demon archetypes that cause treasures that brought down many a kingdom and their starving rulers. These powers come in the form of their laws, for which there are three the malefactors specialize in. The law of the forge, the youngest of the Anunnaki's law, means supreme mastery of the inanimate world. With this law, the Anunnaki can fashion any object imaginable from any kind of material, say, a glass crown or a sword made from stone. Additionally, this law may be used to produce wondrous magical objects or cursed gifts. Those that specialize in this are Mumu, Visage of the Forge. The Mumu were known for their impressive skills in crafting as well as their resilience to both extreme heat and cold. However, when consumed by torment, they transformed into terrifying monsters with forearms, razor-sharp claws, and impenetrable steel-like skin. Chaos seemed to follow them wherever they went. The Mumu were one of several visages that could exist only after the Fallen made contact with humanity, and before that, they often worked with the Zoltu and the Namatem to teach humans how to build and manage their domains using animal examples. However, after Adam forgot how to use a sling they had helped him create, the Mumu began to feel frustrated and rebelled. They eventually became the weaponsmiths of the war, forging weapons for their fellow fallen to use the against their enemies. Many of them went insane after being banished into the abyss, as they were unable to create anything without the necessary tools or materials. The law of the earth allows the Anunnaki to shape earth in many different ways, including metal, concrete and glass, but excluding artificial or living materials. It is similar to the law of the forge in this respect, but much less subtle. They too have their own visage, Kisha, the visage of earth. Kishar angels are massive earthly beings without hair, with eyes made of gemstones. They possess incredible strength, have night vision, and are immune to blunt force. They tend to reflect the colours and textures of the materials they shape. When overcame by torment, Kishar would develop spines and extra arms and emit a foul sap from their bodies. Their dark changes are more mostly physical, lacking subtlety despite their diligence. Although some see the Kashar as simple and primitive, further examination reveals that they were responsible for creating the intricate landmasses and formations of the world. Due to their slow work, most Kashar possess exceptional patience and humanity despite their achievements. While only a few Kashar joined the rebellion, those who did became formidable fighters who harnessed their elements to attack, much like other angels of the elements. Finally, you have the Law of Paths, which allows the Anunnaki to manipulate spatial relationships. It was first used to create space for matter to exist in and allows the Anunnaki to connect different locations in any way they please. And too, the Visage of Paths is the associated visage. 
During the day, the Antu take on a human-like appearance that is quite subtle but at night, deep lines emerge on their form in intricate patterns. The Antu are known for their quick movements, unearing sense of direction and extremely sharp senses. However, when consumed by their torment, they become physically unstable, like well, having these fluctuating proportions and blurred outline. They also tend to cause confusion and uncertainty in those around them. Unlike many other fallen, the Antu do not sprout wings when they transform, as they never needed them to perform their duties or travel. Although some may view the Antu as trailblazers, they played a crucial role in shaping the currents of air and water, as well as the ability of humans and animals to travel. The Adad, Elil, and Kesha angels were particularly instrumental in helping the Antu bring their visions to life. Many of the Antu who have escaped the abyss are troubled by the lack of direction that many humans exhibit and seek to help them find their way, while others seek to further confuse things. When it came time to make humanity, the Aku were responsible for the creation of the body itself, mapping out blood vessels and nerves and placing the organs. They don't, however, really understand humanity. You learn why in a moment, be patient, your lamb. They are unpredictable and messy for one thing, something that many malefactors find difficult to cope with within their own hosts. I would actually say that some are frightened by them, hurt by the rejection, further fearing rejection and that ultimately subverts the Fallen's plans and there's nothing worse than a silly human getting in our way, isn't it, little lamb? The problem is almost always the humans, but of course we know that it isn't actually true. It was God who felt the need to manifest material substance into creation. That is why he made the Artificers, the third house of Elohim, to craft from the edges of reality without overwhelming it with his own powers, which of course used fragments of his own powers. They built the places where the rest of creation could be built, using materials from the abyss, or rather, the notion of matter, the very idea of substance, of solidity. They would be tasked into great space, serving as the divide between this plane and the abyss. They would mould the first atoms, stones, planets, gases, and so on and so forth. They coded the very rules of gravity and physics to create new works. They provided the platform, systems, and rules for the remaining four houses to work with. When asked by the houses to begin, the artificers, the perfectionists that they are, pinched and pulled the tectonic platers and so forth upwards, forming upwards mountains and volcanoes. What? Tectonic plates, not platers. Whatever, you know what I mean. They smoothed out deserts, raised forests and all the rest of it. The artificers would still be tinkering and everything, quite literally, had not Lucifer stopped them. Look, I'm sure that they felt proud of what they had and they told the rest of us that they did, but it was never really perfect for them. Most would feel a little bit of resentment for the Morning Star. keep that in mind. I think you get the idea now. They were the builders of creation. They were not spiritual and ethereal like the rest of us, but beings of material and concrete interests, pun intended. They conversed with spirits, not create to them. The Anunnaki would become increasingly insular as a result, turning in itself, rather conversing with the other houses outside of their work of creation. Everything would change, of course, when God commanded the creation of humanity, those oh-so-perfect humans. They are perfect because the artificers made them so. Once more, letting the other houses do the rest. The first man and woman, Adam and Eve, well, technically Adam and Lilith, but whatever, were the magnum opus. Even they, the Anunnaki, were taken aback by the perfected looks of these two humans. In them, the Elohim, they would soon adorn the title of Malefactor, saw great potential to take the powers of creation beyond the limits of their angelic makers conceived to be possible. In that moment, the Anunnaki were filled with boundless love for humanity, a desire to teach and assist these beings in every possible way, leading them to pure perfection. It was a fleeting feeling for God would lay down his edict for the houses not to get involved with the machinations of humanity, something that confused and upset us all. It may not surprise you that, based on what I just told you, that the Anunnaki were the most affected by this. They were already lonely, unable to connect properly with 
their own ilk. Their companionship was only with others of their own house, you see. All this untapped love with nowhere to go. It certainly didn't go to the creator, for that trust and love for him had been damaged greatly. If anything, it had become tainted with resentment. Confusion would morph into pain and pain into anguish, which would become anger in due course. They did not attend the great debate, but they did debate amongst themselves about what should be done, conflicted to their duty to God and their aspirations for humanity. To Guile, the Ruby Dominion was the one that reminded his house that they were made to create a paradise and not aiding in the human discoveries would mean that God must be defied. Toguire would take over half of the Anunnaki with him, now branded as such. They would join Lucifer, teaching the humans to open their eyes to the potential of creation. They fostered Adam's will to create a home for him and Eve, providing the tools to build the best shelter he could, which would blossom as the rest of humanity's civilization would, although be it in a more primitive manner from our current perspective, that is. This would happen for many, many years, a period known as the Age of Wonder. The rebellious malefactors were never happier but were certain that still that the efficiency could be improved. They created relics and aided humanity with their work. The humans, still in their most basic of forms, did not have the power to harness these relics themselves, remember. Furthermore, many were frightened by the angels and these incomprehensible tools. This fear would morph into resentment, feeling mocked by the superior angels. This would hurt the malefactors once more, making them question why they even bothered helping them at all or any of the emotions they felt for them. What would tip them over the edge was the murder of Abel. For many, it unlocked feelings of hatred and anger, their once happy feeling emotions now consumed with rage and revenge, all consuming. In turn, many turned on Lucifer, no longer seeing his wisdom. Some, however, were inspired by Cain's sins, but you could look that up sometime yourself, maybe. They were amongst the first to turn the heel, the malefactors, I mean. Their goals was to recreate the world according to their own terms, and they resorted to using their abilities, relics, and tools to harm both humans and fallen. They conducted experiments on human beings with the aim of refining their perfect creation. These Anunnaki were the pioneers in using their souls to power relics. On the other hand, the Malefactors were the more peaceful, continued to teach and safeguard humans while supporting Lucifer in his quest to capture the stray legions. After coming together, the Anunnaki began to develop tools that would question and be used by the humans and also taught them how to create their own. Humans started to display their true potential. Zipakana, one of the Anunnaki, believed that if humans and fallen mated, their offspring would be the perfect beings they would seek to create. Sipakania's artifact allowed the fallen to take on mortal forms and have children, but instead of perfection, they produced the Nephilim that I've talked about many times before. These unholy unions led to the downfall of humanity, and the Anunnaki realized that their misguided attempt to regain humanity's affection was their most bitter mistake. In the end, the Anunnaki were left with no choice but to surrender to the host of heaven or sadly end their existence. They watched as heaven destroyed their great creations before marching into the abyss when they no longer could bear the pain. The malefactors found comfort for their own when it came to our imprisonment in the abyss, just as they always had done. They watched and wept as the creator destroyed all that they cherished, their own creations, glistening with crystalline beauty. When they would watch no more, the malefactors would walk into the abyss. With a lack of pretty much everything to occupy the malefactors, they used their cunning and intelligence as a weapon, using their analytic skills where social grace failed them. They would pit themselves against the Nemur, their social rivals, remembering that the arrogance of the Lucifer and his house usurping the perfection of creation. In short, emotions were squashed, allowing cold, calculating intelligence to thrive. Running away and neglecting your feelings was never a great idea, but it works for some, I suppose. For many malefactors, the joy of freedom was overwhelmed with the horror of seeing what creation had been reduced to and the emotional scarring that drives them to punish humanity for never loving them enough. 
Many wish to take revenge on creation, using the freedom to unleash the pain of their torment upon the new world. Some find hope as builders their first and utmost purpose, but all were distracted at first. Their first focus of possession, builders and workers, have never been particularly high up on the social ladder, so to speak. Those with a few more brain cells focused on more advisory roles which, if handled carefully, can wield more power than the ones who actually rule. These days, anyone who feels alienated from society grabs the attention of the malefactor, whether they are a computer hacker or a sociopath, or individuals who make heavy modifications with piercings and tattoos to find their own niche or clique. This, combined with the confusion of mortals, makes it difficult for them to draw faith from them. Not being able to know how humans work makes it more difficult to inspire them, but who needs to know someone in order to dazzle them with relics and other shiny goodies and quick fixes? Some say that they are so reliant on this method that the malefactors can only reap faith this way, though you can tell me that some other time. The Faustians are the most natural fit for the malefactors, making themselves adept at manipulating humanity into chaos. After this, the reconcilers are the next fit, as they can never truly sever their ties to the land. Like the forbidden X you keep finding yourself going back to, for example. Malefactor cryptics use this faction as a means to learn more about humans, to push them, to interact with them more. Oddly, Anunnaki raveners are the least common. For all their bitterness towards humanity's rejections, most malefactors choose to recreate rather than destroy, but truth be told, the Anunnaki are one of the few houses who see their house bond as stronger than the faction bond. The Anunnaki are more willing than the other Sebatu to put aside their differences to work together on a more common goal. Their sacred meeting place, Tala Maktodun, or however the fuck that place is pronounced, still survives in secret, and those who knew where to find it must be willing to put aside their differences of any of the other malefactors if they wish to enter. Don't ask how I know you won't believe the answer. The malefactors, regardless of faction allegiance, believe that something must be done with humanity and creation, but cannot agree what, other than taking control of the material realm and the demonic society they see as their rivals. They are not the ruling voice, but are often the deciding voice. The House of Fire and Stone have a chance to rework, rebuild, and reshape creation to their intended vision and would do so no matter what it takes. They are the Anunnaki, and that is what they have always done and always will do. They can simply do no less. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time. Farewell.